No. Um, so when I went into service in 1990, the border war had just ended. In, so Namibia got its independence in March of 1990. <clears throat> right. So we withdrew in 89, 90. There were some, there were still some uh, troops up in uh, uh, southwest or Namibia. Mm. But yeah, so my, so my shift changed because it was the unbanning of the ANC. So my shift wow. changed to uh, urban warfare. Wow. So we were, we were posted into the townships. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. Crazy, but <laughs> wow. sure, what a story, man! I can't wait to flip and read the book, but it's there were so many things like because I was hey, reading, I was reading through you, all you the. Gotta, you got to buy it first, you punk. Yeah, but bad. <laughs> I, I will, I'm going to buy it, of course, man. Um, I what is going to say? Um, but buy, there was this, there was so, free. there was so many no man. There was um, there was so many things in there like reading your blogs and the Facebook posts and stuff like that yesterday. I was like, wow. I mean. I feel like this is a new person. I don't know if Flip and know this guy has kept all the secrets from me. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's probably a few that'll come out. Uh, cool. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> okay, but cool, man. Well, let's, um, let's all kind of get ready, I think. Um, okay. And then we'll just sort of kick off. Okay, well, good afternoon there, Mr. Fuch, Sean, Fudgy, Sir, Fush. Thanks for <laughs> joining us here on the Ridiculously Human podcast, but it's uh, round two, and I can't believe it when I was looking back, it was 100 episodes that you were uh, first on our podcast, mm. so it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a cool number to sort of return on, so thanks so much for, for joining us today, cool. bud. So is this, yeah, that's, what is this, 116 or? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's spot on. Yeah, crazy, yeah. <laughs> ah. Yeah, so bad. I must just say that like, this is actually like a serious, uh, proud buddy moment um, to to be 100% honest with you. Like, uh, you've been such a massive mentor and influence on me and on my life, and uh, not just me, but on on many other people's lives. Uh, you know, school kids and other people that um, you know have come into your lives. And I just, from the bottom of my heart, want to thank you for for being such a, a positive light and influence on me. And Today, you're joining us for a special reason because uh, you have uh, published a book which is basically getting sent out today. And this is, you know, a story about your life. So um, we're just really excited to be able to speak to you about it in, in a little bit more detail. Um, so, so, yeah, congratulations for, for getting a book out. It really is such an amazing thing. Congrats, Brad. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate those kind words. Yeah, no worries, man. So, so I guess, I guess before we, we get into, you know, into things, it's obviously a crazy time around the world right now. Um, and I think it's interesting for other people to kind of know a little bit about how guys are dealing with it or how they've been influenced by, you know, the whole coronavirus and the lockdown. So, you know, how are you coping? Um, how has it been for you, um, you know, in South Africa? Um, yeah, I think... Uh, I think South Africa has dealt with it um, has dealt with it pretty well in terms of the initial sort of lockdown and how that's been managed. Uh, the The frustration has been the regulations that uh, you can't buy cigarettes, you can't buy alcohol, you can't buy flip flops. You can't. I mean, it's just absolutely absurd, and uh, it's it's uh, it's trying to manage two completely different uh, societies almost. You know, we still have this massive split in South Africa of uh, people that are incredibly poor. Um, and then you have this, uh, this middle class and kind of growing middle class uh, who are in the suburbs or who have houses um, and earn a decent wage. Um, and they're trying to manage the whole country based on, I think, people that uh, are really very poor and don't have the capacity. And uh, that's leaving an, an incredible amount of people frustrated. And so, so have we managed it well in, in a space? We have the same population as Italy. We uh, had our first cases probably two, three weeks, maybe, sorry, about, about a month or so after Italy. And we're sitting with, uh, I think it's about three, 300 odd deaths 
uh, of which the majority have uh, underlying issues. And, um, and so that's, I think from that point of view, it's been managed incredibly well. And we're sitting with about 16,000 positive cases in a population of 52 million people. So that's not bad, but it's going to increase. And it's, yeah, it's, it's going to get, uh, get worse. But how about you? Like, how are you feeling? Because I know you like a real social guy and obviously, you know, you like to be around people and stuff. Um, so how has it actually impacted you from a, maybe more like sort of psychological perspective? Yeah, it's been tough. Uh, it's been tough for, you know, again, it's, it's tough for everyone. And you, 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 I think the nature of people, you feel guilty when you're feeling bad yourself, you know, and other people are in a worse state than you are. So you, you don't like to complain or, you know, feel that you're um, stressed or depressed or whatever it is. But it's very real. You know, we've never dealt with something like this in our lives before. No one has dealt with it. Um, and so it's, uh, we're fortunate, we have a beautiful property, we have a lot of space um, and uh, we can exercise and walk around the property and all of that. So, so we're, very, we're very blessed and, and, um, and fortunate. Um, but I think it's the, it's the fact that we've lost these freedoms and that's the biggest challenge that we're having. You know, you spent your entire life uh, in a, an environment where you make choices, you have freedom of choices, get in the car, go to the shops, choose what to buy, choose, you know, you have all these choices. And now suddenly you have no choice. You're told this is what you can buy, this is what you can't buy. This is the time you can buy it, this is the time you can't buy it. Um, and that is, I think that more than anything really just uh, affects people. And uh, I think a lot of people are sort of, you know, there's a discussion around grieving and how people are grieving because they've lost these freedoms and these choices. And you're almost going through the five stages of grief, of the anger, of the bargaining, of, you know, and, and uh, acceptance eventually. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and it was a very interesting analogy. Mm, there's, sure. there's one specific thing there that's been quite topical is the fact that in South Africa, for the people that don't know, they've actually, you can't actually buy alcohol and cigarettes. And what do you think about, or how is that affecting people you know? And uh, no, I, I, I've, again, it's, it's this dichotomy of two societies of people who are located in the original sort of township areas of South Africa. Um, and uh, the minister, Lamini Zuma, who argues that uh, with uh, no alcohol, the, in the um, emergency wards are empty, you know, casualties mm. empty. We're not having all these uh, stabbings and uh, assaults and rapes, etc. Um, so, and that then frees it up for possible sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, people with uh, coronavirus. The, the, the argument for me is flawed because in a society where I've been drinking probably since I was 15 years old, I've, in all that time, I've never murdered, raped or plundered anyone. So my argument is why am I being punished? Because when I drink, I am relatively responsible and uh, I'm, I'm not going to commit harm or commit a criminal act. So you can't punish your entire society based on, on, on uh, you know, a few people who, who can't handle their alcohol, rather manage that situation than try and manage an entire country. So I think it's absurd and I think it's, uh, I think it's a completely, it's, it's ridiculous. We're supposed to move to level three in the next week and we'll see what happens there. They were supposed to have alcohol. The, the, the theory was that we'd be able to buy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from eight o'clock to, or nine o'clock till 12 o'clock. Once again, like the exercise, you're going to take an entire country uh, over the age of 18, every adult over the age of 18 who wants to buy alcohol is going to be rushing to buy alcohol in the space of three hours. So when your social distancing argument comes, it's ridiculous. You know, so there are really some, the, 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 there are really some laws being implemented, regulations at least being implemented that are completely flawed and nonsensical. Yeah, it's crazy. I saw this um, video of India because they had the same kind of restrictions. And then when they allowed alcohol to be sold recently, I mean, you've never seen queues like this in your entire life. It was just crazy. And yeah. then they had to just kind of 
close the whole idea down again. So, yeah. yeah. And, and we're going to do the same. And I think that's what they're looking at. How do we manage this? They're even looking, there's even talk of it on alphabetical on your, you know, on your surname. So if your surname is uh, Fuchs, you get to go on a Tuesday between 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock. You know, they'll serve all the F's and the G's or whatever the story is. Yeah. Well, crazy times, but that's for sure. So, um, so yeah, I mean, talking about crazy times, I guess, since, since the last time we spoke, a lot has actually changed in your life, I guess, mostly around your working environment and probably for the first time in your life, in your early fifties, you're kind of unemployed because you decided to leave your role and go it alone which is such a brave move. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could kind of tell us like what initiated that and sort of, you know, how has it been for you? Yeah, there's two things that upset me that you've said. One is 50s, uh, really? Are you sure? <laughs> Are we looking at the same birth certificate, Dan? Ah. <laughs> and, and the second is unemployed. Um, <laughs> sadly, both are correct. Um, so... So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd been, uh, uh, I'd, as you know, I left uh, being headmaster in 2015 and then went into the corporate space. And I needed to do that. I needed to go into the corporate space because I'd always wanted to. And I'd, you know, I did my master's degree in business and I wanted to, you know, apply kind of that, that learning, put the reality of that, those processes into place. And uh, a corporate environment is exactly what uh, what, what would uh, lend itself to that. And um, then, uh, and, and yeah, I just unfortunately got to a point where it, it it wasn't for me. I mean, the business of education is very real, and it's a it's it, 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 there, there is ability to make money, and that's not a problem. I don't have a problem with that. I think it's the it's the how you go about it that's the important part and that to me was the issue and so i needed to rather remove myself from that situation than continue in an organization that i didn't believe my values were aligned to to their values and it mm. had nothing to do with the schools or the people in the schools um, you know uh, it was it was a bit more than you know, it was a bit more than that. And uh, unfortunately, I can't go into too much detail because we've agreed not to discuss in depth kind of the, the reasons. But uh, it, it was, I think what I can say is it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Um, I am completely comfortable and uh, happy with that decision. It's, it's a massive risk that you take to resign from a place and not have a job to go to. You know, the book was obviously a main driver um, after me kind of stepping down or resigning. But that's also wasn't, that's not a, you know, a book has a certain longevity. You can't, mm. uh, you're not going to earn an income off it uh, indefinitely. Yeah. So um, it was going to kind of fill a gap. But, mm. uh, but um, yeah, I think it was, it really was one of the best decisions I made. Mm-hmm. Yes, man. Well done. It's it is super brave, and this is a testament to the kind of person that you are. Like you just go, you go and get it, and you you take action, which is is amazing. But you know, you obviously, as you mentioned, you can't really go into it. But you didn't quite see eye to eye with certain aspects of of the leadership in the company. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about sort of what leadership qualities you think are important for any leader to have, and and also in in whatever environment you're in, perhaps. I think modern, you know, modern day leadership is, uh, is it's, it's actually not complicated. Um, and this is the, the, this is, this is the problem is that um, the, the, there's, there are so many different styles of leadership, but in my mind, it's not complicated. Leadership is about inspiring people, is about creating opportunities for people to grow, um, and it's about consultation. Um, and I think those part, those aspects are absolutely important. Um, and you can take that anywhere. You can take that as a sports coach. You can take that as a teacher. 
anywhere where people look up to you or you're in an environment where you need to lead, I think those principles are quite, are quite straightforward and quite important. Um, uh, I, I always go back to what, what motivates students, what really excites students. One, they're going to learn something new. The teacher cares about them and they're going to have fun. And that, that applies in the workplace as well. So does, my, does the person I work with, does the person I work for, my boss, does that individual inspire me? Do they care about me? Uh, am I going to have fun at work? Um, and uh, and uh, am I going to learn something new? Is my own development going to be fulfilled? And I think those, that, that applies, uh, you know, that applies throughout. And when you're not having any, when you're no longer getting that, that's when people really are starting to look at other alternatives. They're starting to look at other options for employment um, uh, because they're not being fulfilled. Mm, yeah, that's certainly great advice, but that's definitely. And I think, yeah, I mean, sure, the world needs good leaders now, that's for sure. And um, <laughs> I'm glad that, that I've had one like you in my life, that's for sure. So, so just talking about the, this this phase, I think transitionary phases can be sort of quite difficult and challenging. Um, is there anything that maybe like you've struggled with a little bit, um, maybe like a, a set, your sense of purpose and these sort of things since leaving? Yeah, you've, um, I, don't, I don't think, you know, I think combined with the lockdown, uh, if we didn't have this COVID crisis, things would be very different, but things would be very different for everyone. So again, it's not just me, but um, I think that really frustrated a lot of things because obviously my purpose at this point was, uh, or the immediate kind of action was to the book launch and the book tour and everything that came with that. But you, you, you still have an intrinsic purpose. My purpose has always been about inspiring people. Um, and and has always been about mentoring and developing people and growing people, um, and that can continue. That continues all the time, you know. So a, a day doesn't go by where I talk to someone or uh, give assistance or motivate or try and inspire someone. Um, so that continues. So you still have that purpose. That you know, uh, you know, I don't need to be employed or working for an organisation to to have a purpose like that. I think that's more an intrinsic purpose, and that's. And that's very important. Mm, cool. Yeah, your deep values are are there. They they within you. Whether and, and if in business in a business sense, you might take your values that are already within you into that business, but not necessarily the other way around. So, um, yeah. So therefore, you, wherever you go, what's getting your legs swinging out of bed in the morning? It's not going to work. It's the it's the idea of helping someone at work or wherever you are. So. That's a good lesson to just take, yeah. but yeah. part of like inspiring people, you know, you have to disseminate that information sometimes to people. And I guess um, one way to do that, and we touched on it already is, is a, is a book. So you've, you've written a book called push a, a, a story of pride and success, which is part autobiography, memoir, and part leadership and overcoming adversity. So what really prompted you to, to write this book actually? Um, around about last year, June, uh, May, June, I, um, uh, I had come, I'd come home and, uh, Gordon had said that he'd kind of made a comment along the lines of that. I've lost that passion. I just, he doesn't see that spark anymore. And I think that was part of the, there was a large part of the environment that I was in, um, and, and kind of the, the, the space that was taking place in my work environment. Um, and I agreed with it and I thought actually one, one of the areas that I really want to get back into is, um, my, uh, speaking. So talking to, you know, motivational speaking and that, and the, the, the guys that I work with had always, uh, work with in the, the motivational speaking grounds that said they, you need to, you need to try and put out a book, put out something that kind of, you know, it, it it gives authenticity to you as a speaker and and that so and i thought well actually let me let me do that let me write something that's positive something that people can read and will enjoy and will kind of give them uh, you know some some inspiration maybe um 
and the initial thinking was that I would write uh, a book on diversity. So overcoming diversity and the challenges that you face. And in particular, because I, as a, as a gay person, uh, had, uh, had some challenges that I had to overcome as a kid, as a teenager, as a young adult, as, even as an, as, as an adult into more mature adulthood. Um, I thought that would be, you know, we could take some lessons of that and, and put it into the diversity space. Um, and the, yeah, the book then became quite organic and evolved more than kind of a, 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 a memoir from growing up and, and taking certain stories and uh, speaking to those stories and getting a lesson out of each story, which then became a chapter and then led through a chronological event through the book. Um, so kind of starting in the 60s when I was born and finishing in 2015 when I stood down as head of school. Um, so that's really the background into getting started on the book. And, and Bud, you also mentioned that writing the book has been quite a reflective process for you. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? Why have you enjoyed writing it? And also some of the sort of connections that it has rekindled for you? Yeah, so first of all, I think that every single person, and I, I've said this on some of the social media accounts, every single person has a book in them, everyone, all of us. Uh, because we all have a story to tell and we all have stories. You know? So when you watch a movie, which is a life story on someone, that was a, just an everyday person like you and I um, and just a normal human being. And we just then tell stories. And I think one of the things that I'm good at is telling stories. So um, the, 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 the desire to write the book is the biggest challenge. Uh, or the biggest challenge is actually to write the book. So we all have a book in us, but not everyone gets to write the book. That's the, uh, you know, everyone wants to, but we don't. Um, so putting, doing my research and kind of going back into the 70s and kind of speaking to my mom about the 60s and really trying to get the detail because I'm a, a history teacher, the facts were very important for me. Um, so I needed to kind of research that. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting uh, stories that sort of came on the back of it, which is not in the book, but was sort of behind it, was doing the research into the 70s where my dad had uh, sold his very successful engineering business um, and had bought uh, two gyms, health studios, one in town in Rissick Street, Joburg, uh, Rissick Street, and one in Hillbrow. And the one in Hillbrow was called American Health Studio. And um, I joined a Facebook group called Survivors of Hillbrow. And uh, a lot of old people on there about like in their 50s and that. And um, sorry, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> and anyway, I post you know, 50 and up. But, and I posted in there uh, that picture of my dad who was kind of uh, posing on the top of the roof uh, and uh, I said, listen, if anyone knows, this is my father, Will Fuchs, and if anyone remembers him, please, uh, you know, could you let me know, post some stories. Uh, he owned American Health Studio in uh, the 70s in, um, in Hillbrow. And the comments, uh, you know, people, it's just unbelievable. I mean, the comments that people put up because so many of the people obviously remembered him who trained and lived in Hillbrow in the 70s and into the 80s and they remembered him and this one comment just kept coming up about Alfie and I was and Alfie this and Alfie was an assistant uh, instructor or was an instructor at the gym and Alfie used to kill them and train them and make them run up Nugget Hill and Nugget Hill is literally a, a uh, uh, sort of an incline like this um, and it's a, a street that leads up into Hillbrow itself and uh, they just kept on the alpha I was like who the hell is Alfie so eventually I've got to hold my mom I said listen this is what I've done and I need to know but who's Alfie she said oh Alfie no, Alfie was a packer at uh, the checkers in in um, Hillbrow and uh, my dad obviously shopped there and um, got to know Alfie and Alfie was an, he had an incredible physique 
and my dad invited him to come and train and then employed him as an instructor um, after hours, so after he would finished work at Checkers. Um, and I thought that was phenomenal. And my mom said, you know, Alfie and your dad were incredibly close. And then you kind of go back to 1970s South Africa, which is the height of apartheid. Um, and there my dad was getting a black guy into the gym, working there, training all these obviously white clients um, and, and really kind of looking after, uh, you know, Alfie's interests. Um, and I never knew that. I never knew that, uh, certainly that part about my dad at all. So I, that was interesting. And yeah, people kind of spoke uh, about his involvement in Kissment, which was a show at the Civic Theatre where they employed my dad and three other bodybuilders. And they had to work with uh, a star of the 70s Afrikaans singer by the name of Hay Kosten. And uh, they kind of worked with him and had to carry him around because it was like set in, in Arabia. And, uh, and, and I remember that as a kid because I remember my dad going every night for like two, three weeks uh, for the actual show and then the rehearsal and, uh, and some of his costumes that he wore. And that's nice. So it was really interesting picking that up. Hmm. So cool. It's interesting how I was just saying to Gareth before we got on the call, like just reading through some of the stuff um, about that, that you talked about with, with your book and that um, it just brought back so many memories for me because I studied uh, just underneath the Ponty building there in uh, in uh, Hillbrow. So I went there basically every day of my life for six years and I had, I used to catch the bus. So I used to catch two buses and I'd walk through President Street, Rissick Street and then get down Elof and whatever. And um, And it was so funny just thinking about how different Hillbrow was what from when I was a student now in, in Joburg mm -hmm. versus it was quite cosmopolitan and, and sort of happening, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, Hilbra in the 80s, which is really when I remember it properly, was like Manhattan. It was the, the most unbelievable vibe, energy. Uh, you could get anything you wanted there. You did everything. It catered for every aspect of society. Uh, it was an incredible um, sort of urban utopia almost uh, I, I loved it it was, it was a very special place yeah it's crazy how it, uh, it has changed but um, before we get stuck in further um, Sean maybe we can just talk a little bit about the writing process itself um, maybe can you take us through what it involved for you and sort of from the start yeah I mean a lot of it was so I worked with a guy Tudor um, who had uh, has really got some top writing experience and um, we we spent a lot of time together and uh, putting thoughts down kind of uh, I'd put the framework of the chapters that I'd wanted to discuss and that I thought were um, you know relevant to the book and then we really started adding on the meat or you know the content and the and really kind of um, uh, putting the, the, the book together. The, the first draft is probably quite close to the final one, but uh, what was so interesting to see was how with the editors that came in, um, how absolutely accurate they were, how much attention they gave to detail, um, what was working, what flowed, what didn't flow, uh, because you see it all the time and you're reading it and you're constantly working on it. Um, so when, when I eventually read, and I've obviously read this book more than I think I've read any book in my entire life. And when I eventually read the final draft that was going to go through to the printers, uh, it was, I thought it was an incredible read. It was such a comfortable read. It was so, and, and, and what I've been very clear on is it needed to be an easy read. Uh, my very good friend, Rose Morris, who's a teacher, English teacher, and um, when I spoke to her initially about it in, with the initial concept, and I'd said to her that I want to write, she said, listen, most people don't read, and that's true, most people don't read, uh, sadly, me included, but if the book is straightforward and it's an easy read, uh, then they'll read it, and that's what I've been very clear on focusing on, it needed to be a very easy read. What and makes something an easy read? Yeah. Sorry. I think it just needs to flow, you know. I think you just need to be able to relax and read and just let let it flow without it being too complicated. Mm. 
but there was also like also i mean just some of the kind of nitty-gritty things i guess about writing a book like it was interesting like you i think you you flew to cape town to to meet your um the writer and then um and then like you guys would spend a few days together and these sort of things can you tell us like a little bit more about that you know like how you actually get to the meat of the kind of book yeah sure so so um the book is about telling a story. So when I sat with, uh, we, we recorded a lot of it. So there was a lot of recording taking place. Um, and uh, we, and, and then the, the, that was sent through to uh, some dear old auntie in Hans Bay, who for extra money literally types everything. So if she took our podcast, she would literally type everything from, um, job could you turn off the uh, uh, leaf blower to and so and so you sit with this mass of um, you know you sit with this mass of uh, of of sort of uh, content and then start working through it so so you just have pages and electronic pages and pages and pages uh, of the stories but with everything in it and then start working through it so that's where Tudor was absolutely fantastic so where he would do that and really start kind of formulating the stories and that's where him and I would then engage and uh, make sure that the accuracy is there that that's the tone that I want um, mm-hmm. and and kind of how you know um, and and uh, it needs to be me so as much as you collaborate with someone at the end of the day that has to be me it can't be him and and, and do you and get like you- Sorry, you go, go, Craig. No, go for it. Do you, do you get like protective at all? I'm just wondering like when the Oaks, like, like the, you know, Tudor's like, no, you must, you must take this part out. And do, is, do you ever have those sort of, sort of feelings that, that sort of no, rough because you? No, because it was 100% my book. The, the, the only time where we kind of had that was with the final edits and the editor, uh, Nicole, um, uh, and she, she was, but she was just so professional. And her and you know again go back to being a teacher. If you've got a valid history, you you have a valid argument which you can substantiate. How do you argue against that? And that's and that's exactly what was happening as well. You know. Cool. And with the voice notes, were you just you obviously had a framework or a skeleton by that stage, but would you just sort of download on these as much as you could and just recant yeah. stories and stuff, or would you would you sort of try and edit yourself as you were talking through the voice notes. No, no, I just want to close this a bit. To, is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, 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 you know, you would, you would do something and then go to bed and then later think, oh my word, I forgot about this or I forgot yeah. about that. And then you go back and you add it. And often when you're reading through this, through the, 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 the content you and then you remember actually no I need to add this in or take that out um, and and again it was a very organic process um, but it was it you know I really I really thought it was uh, I really enjoyed that and then I would reach out to like Gareth for the London bombing 77 and he would then leave a voice note of what he remembers and that would need to obviously align with my kind of memory of it. I did the same with some of my other past students, um, right through to my final assembly as headmaster in 2015, where uh, one of the students, Justin, uh, put some wonderful kind of voice notes together on exactly how they as students felt and, and what they took out of it, which was different to what I would see it as. So yeah. cool. What a great process. And, and also just, we, we would have to have a little shout out to uh, a previous guest on our show and friend, Devin Lester, for taking the pics for the book cover yeah. as well. It was epic. So, well, that was, was what's been so nice is that, uh, you know, he, he was involved in one of the chapters that we talk about with uh, the travel business and starting the business and tours going overseas. He, he was on that first tour that we ever did as a, with our travel business um, to go to Australia. So it was really nice to be able to bring him into that and with him having shot the, the cover photographs. Yeah, it's so cool, like all those connections and stuff. And I think one of the other cool things which, um, which is nice about, so say, talking about your, your own story or writing about your own story is that um, after you maybe have written something, 
like you said, like you'll be lying in bed and you'll be like, oh, actually there was something else, you know, and there's all these other memories that are kind of sitting there in our kind of subconscious that pop up and they're just, they're just these nice kind of reminders and, you know, they, they sometimes make you think, oh, you know what, I should maybe get in touch with that person or they just leave like a nice little smile on your face when, yeah. you know, thinking about them. Yeah, listen, uh, it's, uh, I would, uh, just from, when I look back at the experience, I would encourage everyone to, to write a book because just being able to, you know, go back and the, and, and it, the memories are there. You just need to unpack them and you need a reason to unpack them. Um, and, and it's so interesting uh, and it's amazing how fresh those memories then become actually. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like we the don't way think about you, it. I like the way you go in there with a sort of a, like a sort of a, as a historian, you know, you, you want multiple data points to, to validate because we all know that our memories are fallible and that's obviously a true testament to a true historian to try and not just write about what you remember of that. You're actually getting multiple angles and then amalgamating those to say, cool, this is the, this is the event that actually happened. And that's, that's also kind of cool digging it yeah. that way, you know? Yeah. And, and that's why I think the book is going to read so nicely because you can relate it. And certainly in a South African context, it also relates to really big milestones in our, in our own country's history. That's awesome. Yeah, but so so talking about the book, uh, we've only read snippets of it, and um, you know from blog, blog posts and that that you've written. And I must say, like, there's even though I've known you practically my whole life, I was like, who is this guy? Like, there's all these cool stories that I don't know. So I really can't wait to actually get stuck into the full book. Um, but but kind of one of the things that has obviously been a big influence and in part of your life is uh, is schooling. It just plays such a big part. And, and in chapter one, you actually kick off with uh, primary school days. And it, there's some really cool lessons in there because I think you, you struggled a bit with being bullied. Um, and then 40 years later, it's funny how the circle of life sort of kind of, you know, plays out. But mm -hmm. um, one of those bullies you sort of saw again in the corporate world. And yeah, it's just a really cool story. So maybe you can just sort of, you know, expand on that a little bit for us. Yeah, so the, the, there's two parts to it. The one is the the chapter called the Anglo Boer War, and um, in 1979, Goth, my older brother, and myself were sent to boarding school, which was about three four hundred kilometres north of Joburg, in a little hamlet called Heinersburg. And uh, Heinersburg is situated between Old Petersburg, Zanin, or to modern day Polokwane and Zanin. And a beautiful area, lots of hills, pine forests, um, and a, a really great school. The school was English and Afrikaans, so it was bilingual, with the minority of people being English, the majority of people in that area, farmers and Afrikaners. And so on a weekly basis, we, we would have the rendition of the anglo Boer War between the Afrikaners and the English guys. And we would then have these fights uh, and uh, there would be physical fights and um, uh, whoever kind of last man standing would win. Uh, fortunately, I was quite a big guy and uh, I managed to dig up some photos. So there's a photograph of the, uh, the following year, 1980, when I was in standard five, grade seven, and, and I'm head and shoulders above everyone else because uh, I was a, I was a big guy in, at, at school so so had a lot of those fights but we kind of but funnily enough my best friend was um, at the time was Afrikaans so we kind of had this strange relationship of the the Sotis with versus the Afrikaners and um, and and spent a lot I spent a lot of great stand of four stand of five uh, fighting uh, which was absurd because that's not really in my nature. I say that, but it's, uh, uh, earlier on it was, and um, and then uh, and and interestingly, as a side note, when I was doing my research into the book, uh, my, my best mate then Kibit, who was also that was his nickname, but his name was Casper Amanus Lawrence. And um, when I researched, I managed to find his older brother on Facebook and. Um, 
kind of sent him a message and then I found his, his, uh, what, his second oldest brother as well, Brian, on Facebook and sent them both messages. This is who I was. I was very good friends with Kivit. I'm trying to track him. And Barry came back and sadly Kivit had been killed in a hit and run in 1998 in Newcastle. So, you know, the last time I saw him was uh, in the end of 1980 when we finished primary school and mm -hmm. he went to Tom Nordea school in Petersburg and I went to Grenville in Rustenburg and then eventually Jeppe. So the book, the research in the book, you picked up a lot of other stories uh, that kind of were subsequent to that and discovered who's done what and where people have gone and that. Um, and then leaving primary school, Garth had been sent to a school called Grenville in Rustenburg in 1980. And in 1981, when I went into Standard 6, I was sent to the same school. Um, and it was only in 1982 that when I was in Standard 7 that I went to Jeppe. And um, Grenville was was an incredibly tough school. Again, it was the only English speaking school in Rustenburg, which was an incredibly uh, dominated Afrikaans environment. Uh, and I had to actually be careful that, uh, certainly in the early parts of the book, that it wasn't an English versus Afrikaans thing. But actually, that was the reality. It was. You, you, you competed against Afrikaans people all the time for everything. Um, and um, because that was very clear in my schooling and so certainly even at, uh, when I was a teacher training college at uh, JCE Vitz, um, that, that was very much the same thing. And, uh, and in, in Standard 6, again, I was the biggest guy in Standard 6, uh, grade 8, in, um, in the school. And the, the seniors, a number of the seniors loved that because they could beat the hell out of you and uh, and completely bully you and th those days and and th there was no teachers that you could run to there was no rights there was none of, you just literally had to defend yourself mm -hmm. um and and i remember this guy uh, and uh, this guy vernon sort of he was in grade 11 standard nine at the time and he physically used to beat me every single week that until i actually yes. first uh, would cry um, and uh, his favorite was take, hitting you on your thigh, but on the same spot and probably hit you about 20, 30 times as hard as he could. So you actually couldn't feel your legs. I mean, that's how bad it was. Um, his other favorite activity was setting up fights. So you would have to literally like gladiators, <laughs> you'd have to fight someone. And I remember standing there and I mean, I was a great eight. I was 14 years old. What did I know? I mean, I'd fought the Boer War two years, for two years. And yeah, these were English guys and I was having to fight them. And I remember going into the laundry room and the seniors were all in a big circle. And this guy who was two years older than me had wanted to obviously beat me up. So they'd set up this fight. And before I even knew it, this guy had punched me in the face, my jaw, my nose. I mean, I was just, hit, I mean, I hit the concrete floor lying there crying. Uh, yeah. You know, and, for them, this was exciting. This was fantastic. This was entertainment. Um, it was completely barbaric. And, uh, and it probably speaks to why my entire life, I've never bullied anyone. I've never victimized or bullied anyone because I always, you, uh, I'd always spent time looking after people and nurturing people. It was, it's not in my DNA to bully anyone. And, um, and uh, this guy, I eventually left at the end of standard six, went to Jeppe, and that was a different story altogether. Uh, I loved my time at Jeppe. And uh, years later, when I was the uh, GM for the Centurus group, this guy was one of the headmasters that would report to me and had not kind of been doing what he should have been doing and was asked to leave. So he was literally fired and uh, now teaches at another school with a competitor. But uh, it was it was it was justice, and it was it was actually quite sweet. <laughs> oh, it's yeah, crazy, so hey! Drama. Yeah, <laughs> you never, you seriously, you never know, hey, like um, how how life will turn out, and how sort of roles will reverse, and these sort of things. Um, and 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 he probably didn't remember me, you know, because you don't really remember the yeah. You, as a as a junior, you remember the seniors, but the seniors don't really remember you, but. It was definitely justice. And you know what's also crazy is like just to think 
when you were such, when you were lighties, when you were so young, beating each other because of, you know, those sort of English Afrikaans divisions, that's all just like programming from the parents because you're all so young. You know, it's, it's just crazy to think of yeah. what each other's parents were saying about the other ones in, in, uh, at home, you know, um, and uh, yeah, all from old history. So you've had, look, many, many hurdles along, along your way, uh, one of them being bullied and, and things like that as a, as a youngster, um, but one of them also being life-affecting homophobia. Um, what were those homophobic instances and, and how did you deal uh, with them and overcome them? Yeah, I think one of the things that, uh, th that um, I don't want to say fortunate because it's not about being fortunate, but one of the things I never suffered was physical beating because of the fact that I was gay. Um, and that, that probably would maybe attest to my size, the fact that I was a big physical guy. Um, so that was never it. But interestingly, those are the, the, those are the parts that you can probably manage a lot better than the psychological or the taunting kind of parts. Um, and I think a lot, of, a, a lot of the society that I grew up with in the 80s, particularly to an extent at school, um, and into and into university to an extent as well. Uh, it was just there was always an underlying issue. So there was there was always this underlying comments, um, and uh, so whenever whenever something needed to be uh, degraded or uh, put down on or negative comments, are you fag, uh, or that is so gay? And and so you can imagine as a young gay person. Um, growing up where every comment you hear about you know who you are in terms of your own sexuality every single comment about it is negative there's nothing positive it's all negative and that continuous reinforcement uh it really uh, impacts uh your you, you, your thinking your your psyche your confidence in who you are as a human being um and you and how do you challenge it you know, because no one really speaks positively. Um, I think to a large extent, things have changed today in 2020. Things are very different, but it's the, it is still there. So the one aspect of the homophobia is this constant underlying kind of thing that comes through all the time. Um, one of the other times that, uh, that uh, I had, um, uh, was in the army and I mentioned this in the one in the one chapter where when I'd signed up I'd wanted to go to infantry school to become an officer um, I'd always been and it was nothing to do with uh, that it was the apartheid government it was to do with the military I'd always been interested in the military um, and I'd wanted to become an officer and um, signing up one of the during the initial stages one of the comments that they actually ask that you have to fill out is have you had a homosexual relationship uh, or been involved in any homosexual activities and that and that was 1990 and I just graduated and I was about 22 23 years old and of course I'd kind of started dealing with my sexuality in the late 80s when I was sort of third fourth year at university and um, and, and so it was, it was really difficult, you know, when you're asked a question, and imagine being asked a question, um, do you have two hands? No, I don't. <laughs> but you know you do. You know, I'm, I'm just simplifying it. You, you, where you have to lie to your, you, know, you have to lie because if you don't, you're going to get thrown out. And that was really tough because I, I had to lie. I said, no. And I knew I was lying, and I knew that that was wrong, but, and, and I knew it was absurd. The reality was, and this, of course, is the entire flaw in, 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 in our society, because I said no, it was fine, and I went on to become an infantry officer. I went on to head up the entire company. I went on to play very strong leadership roles within the army itself, um, uh, and all because I'd said no. If I'd said yes, I wouldn't have been allowed to do any of those things because of who I was. So here I was lying to the army about who I was and 
to myself, I said, well, I'm going to bite the bullet on this one and prove that this is not the case. Um, so so that, was, that was really difficult. And once again, growing up, the underlying everything about you in terms of your sexuality is negative, reinforced all the time. Then you get to the army. Now you've got to lie about who you are because if you say, yes, you're not good enough, you, you won't be good enough like everyone else. So you have to lie about it and pretend. Um, so, so that continuously works against you. Um, later on, when I got to Four Ways High School, um, one of the, and, and um, in probably closer to, I think, uh, two, two or three years, or I'd been teaching at Four Ways already, one of the members of the governing body had found out that I was gay. And uh, for him, this was completely unacceptable. Uh, that I coached the first team water polo, I coached the rugby team, I was a teacher, I was a phys ed teacher, uh, rugby coach, and uh, I needed to be removed and I had to be kind of taken out of the school, unacceptable. And uh, that's where people like Malcolm Park, who was the headmaster at the time and a huge mentor and influence in my life was absolutely not, that's not gonna happen. You know, he goes, I go type of thing. and. Uh, the, member of the governing body eventually had to shut up and uh, and deal with his own homophobia um and and i think the, the 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 final incident you know really for me was in 94 when uh, gordon and i had gone overseas and we had come back and um one of the kids had obviously seen us out at the clubs in Rosebank or whatever it was. And I, when I arrived back, we, we had a great time overseas and uh, I arrived back to start term three and at the, on the wall, the entrance of uh, Four Ways High School, there was a huge um, letter sprayed, uh, Fox you faggot, um, for obviously everyone to see coming back the first day. And, and that was, and, and that was, again, something that you kind of drive in your car, you're trying to be, now remember, you're coming from the back end of being um, stigmatized, being told everything about you is wrong, everything you're going to hell, uh, it's evil, it's negative, there's nothing positive about being a homosexual. And then you arrive as this teacher, kind of after an amazing holiday, and you get that on the front of the school, you know. And, and at that point, I was like, stuff that, no more. I couldn't care. And I went and uh, told Malcolm. He didn't, it was not even an issue. I, as I think I say in the book, I might as well have told him, listen, my hair is blue. Or my, I have 10 fingers or nine and a half fingers or whatever it is. Um, he didn't even blink. He was like, so what's the problem type of thing. Um, and, and, that, and, that, and that was great because... Uh, it, it was the turning point for me where I was no longer going to lie who I, about who I was and, and I would bring who I was into the classroom and onto the sports field because that was an, an incredible and incredibly important part of my character and the person I was. And for me, what was important, I didn't want any of my students who, who, who felt they were different didn't have to be that they were gay or anything, but just felt they were different to feel prejudiced. They could feel confident and feel good about who they were. Mm. So, so just to understand, prior to that, you, had, you hadn't really discussed it at all. No one officially knew. No, no one knew. Okay. No one knew. Okay. No. no, no one knew. So from there, it was, uh, and, and from there, it was, it was the best thing that I'd ever done. You know, and, and honestly, 99% of, of people never had an issue with it, ever. Mm. I remember one of the things that I thought was really awesome that you used to do was we, we would have like sports tours and things like that. And um, we, you know, I, I played first team water polo and um, I think it was in standard seven or something like that. Uh, we went down to the coast and what you did, it was like a traditional thing is you invited the captains for like a, a dinner with the coaches, which is like a big thing, you know, I was like, wow, we're going to dinner with the coaches, it's crazy. Um, but part of that, what you did is you, you basically wanted to open up and, and tell the guys, you know, tell the captains, look, this is who I am. This is what I am. And I just mm -hmm. think it's important that you know, and basically what, that's what you did. You said, just so you know, I'm gay. And I just wanted to tell you that. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. Like that you said that and you were just comfortable saying that to us. And I think it was just 
you know, for me, I, I mean, looking back on it now, you know, hindsight's a great thing. And I just like, that was just, I think that was kind of like what cemented the relationship for you and me, you know, it was like, wow, he's just so open and honest and just, you know, courageous, should I say as well. And I think that was such a powerful thing. And obviously, you know, having that truth and openness and honesty is such, so important in life. And uh, it just sort of builds a trust and um, yeah, it was a really powerful thing. So, so thanks for doing that. No, it's, you know, I think one of the biggest fears that we have is rejection. And uh, it's, it's when dealing with family, so uh, family and friends and telling people and being honest. So it's, it's very powerful to make an honest statement, but there's also consequences uh, sometimes for that. So I might be bringing my, uh, I'm in a very traditional family, it could be Greek, Portuguese, Jewish, doesn't matter what it is. And I bring my uh, black girlfriend who I'm going to introduce to my parents. Now, you're being honest and you're kind of, but again, it's not the norm. It's not what should be happening. Um, and for that honesty, there are consequences, you know, um, so it, it's, it's, it's important to be honest, but it's, you, you also have to be strong enough to deal with the consequences. You know, you could have taken it very differently and gone home to your parents and told them, and they could have been incredibly in, insulted. Why is my, why are you telling my child this? Why, you know, so obviously that wasn't going to happen. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's very real. So it's, it's, you've got to be strong. To, to be able to be honest, sadly. But, but hearing that story, you know, it, like you said, Gareth, it's uh, in hindsight, it's always easy to, to, to do that. But it's just crazy in a way that that was even a necessity, you know, to, or maybe it wasn't a necessity, but you felt that that was the right thing to do. And all parties involved were grateful that you did that. But at the end of the day, if, if you were not homosexual, you wouldn't have, you just could have cracked on and, you know, they, you don't divulge your, your sexual mm. preferences to everyone you meet, you know what I mean? Um, and, and it's a strange that, that, that we live in a world where that was done and it was received in a, such a way where, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like it just, it's now it's, it's, it's easy to say that obviously in a, it was a different time, but in our lifetimes that that was almost a necessity is just kind of strange. Hey? Well, it's, it's going to, I mean, it, I think it just gets better. And um, I, you, you know, one thing that I've always been very aware of, and maybe again, the history person in me is talking to people and learning and kind of getting stories. And so we have a, very close relationship, friendship with uh, uh, a couple, Sol and Peter, and they, they, they're they both in their 80s now. And they've been, they've been together. Uh, Peter was born in 1936 and Sol in 1938. And um, they, they, they have been together over 50 years. I think we celebrated their 50th anniversary last year. And what's so important is going back in history, so understanding from them what it was like in the 50s, you know, in the 60s, in the 70s, um, certainly as, as, as gay men. Um, and, you know, the story of they bought their house that they're still living today in the 70s, and they had to buy a corner house because the, on the one street would be Sol's address, on the other street would be Peter's address. But it's the same house, just it was a corner house and two streets, obviously. So they had to do that for professional reasons so that people didn't see they were living in the same uh, house, you know. Um, and, and that's so important. And, and I think it's something that to an extent with, with certainly with a lot of young um, sort of uh, gay people today, they, you know, I don't know if they, you know, I don't know if they're interested. In, in the stories and I don't know if they're interested in kind of the, the, the struggles that you had and kind of going to a club in the 80s and the police raiding it because they were going to murder these morphies and beat them up and arrest you and do whatever because it was illegal you know so you would be at a club just joining and doing your thing and next thing there would be tear gas and there would be police raiding it and with batons and ready to beat up the morphies what for it was men people enjoying themselves you know um, you can imagine that today you know, it's just, you can't even think about it like that. So it is, you know, it is something we've, we, we've lived to and it is, 
it's it's not normal uh, for me. I think I think I've always been about normalcy and and about and I, and I hate to say uh, to say it. Um, you want to be normal. What is normal? You know, you just want to lead a good life, a clean life, mm. and be a happy person. Mm. Yeah. Yes. It's um, it must be so difficult though. But like, I mean, I think you know, Craig and I are lucky. We're just kind of like white, straight, normal blokes, and and we've never really had to deal with any of that. And I think uh, that's why it's also really important to to know these things, so you can understand that people have had these certain struggles in their lives, and you maybe need to just treat them with a little bit more compassion and be nice and stuff, because we all have had such different backgrounds, and especially people that have suffered this sort of prejudice, you know, like, we really need to be nicer to them and more understanding about, you know, kind of who they are and what makes them up. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, that. I, 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 I hear what you're saying. I don't, you know, I don't think, I mean, I, I have gay friends that are absolutely, well, they're not friends The people are, that are revolting. I wouldn't want them near me. I mean, I block their numbers on, on my phone because they are just ugly human beings. You know, so, so again, I think my caution is it has to be about people. It's not, yes, my history and there was, there was some prejudice. There was, uh, maybe I had to fight a little bit harder because of who I was, whatever the story is, but you've had your own struggles. You know, Craig has had his own struggles, has got his own, you've got your own. Also, we all have a journey that we, we kind of go through in life. Um, and so I don't think one needs to single it out for anything. You know, you, you, you don't have to do that. Um, just f again, focus on, on good human beings. That's that to me is more important. Don't, mm. don't put, don't put a label on it. Yeah. I agree with you 100%, you know, that it's, it's about the individual always. However, there's a certain flavor to other people uh, having an interest in your life and it, there's something feels different about that. And, and that's why I think it, mm. it rubs us certainly Gareth and I the wrong way, you know, to hear that, you know, I understand what you're saying as well. We all have our struggles, but my struggles tend to be my own, like, geez, I've had a tough day because I, I, I didn't get the, the to-do list done today or something. But if, if I had to feel, uh, the pressure of other people judging me because I have a big nose or because I'm straight, that, that feels very different. And I think it, it is important to sort of really um, focus in on that and say like, that's, that's not okay. You know, like, as you say, it's about the individual treat people as human beings and that's what it comes down to. Mm. Mm. Spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Um, yeah, I love what both of you say there. I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's really important to, to just consider all these sort of like sides of a story and how people think. So thanks for sharing that guys. Um, but folks, one of the craziest stories, which is also a chapter in your book is the London bombings of, uh, July, 2005. And, um, you know, just like a quick little sort of, you know, my intro to the story is you actually, you and I were actually at, uh, at dinner the night before. And uh, I think we were having Indian, which we, we generally had <laughs> when we caught up in London. And we were just talking about the day that you'd had and you just bought these cool new shoes because you always came to London and you would always like buy new tires and shoes and you're always proud and would always show me these things. And <laughs> you were telling me like how you've got this big meeting the next day um, to go see a big uh, travel agency uh, because you were going to do some business with them. And, you know, that was like an, you know, an amazing evening. And then uh, next morning I woke up and I woke up actually a little bit earlier than normal. Um, probably because I didn't sleep that well because we had too many beers <laughs> and um I, I went from my house to, uh, to Liverpool Street in London. And um, yeah, and then I was sitting in my office and I, I can't remember the exact time, but it was like 7.38 or whatever. And all of a sudden things started going crazy and um, there was bombs that went off all over London. And one of them was like really close to, you know, where, where I kind of worked. Um, and I think if I had caught the later train, then I would have, possibly been kind of much closer to to where actually one of the bombs was 
Um, but I, I, I remember ringing you kind of in a bit of a panic and going, hey, are you okay? Or just going, just so you know, there's some bombs gone off in London. You might struggle to get to where you are. And I think you were on the phone, you, you were on the train at the time uh, on your way there. And you're like, no, I'm cool. I'm okay. Don't worry. I'm, I'm actually on the train already. So thanks for letting me know. Um, I'll talk to you later. Like, and we just didn't kind of think it was like a massive deal. Um, but then it ended up being quite a crazy day, didn't it? It was unbelievable. So um, I've, I've actually got a live Facebook talk on Wednesday. Uh, and, and this is the chapter I'm going to talk about. And it's probably the closest to my book launch that I'll, that I'll get. Um, other than you guys are the first to really properly kind of interview and launch the book. So, you know, well done to you. But um, briefly, I had 43 students that I was taking overseas. And we were started in America, started in Washington, moved to New York. In New York, I took them to see what was left of the World Trade Center area. It was 2005. So it was four years afterwards. And uh, obviously, there was, there was a lot of construction taking place at that point. And <clears throat> I had, uh, we were then flying New York to London. And as we were... Uh, checked through the one kid came to me and said Christopher and said sir my um, I've left my uh, money belt on the bus and he had a thousand dollars in and so I spent a lot of time trying to get hold of the bus company to get the thousand dollars and the driver said he's never seen this doesn't know what we're talking about so the driver went away with a thousand dollars and Christopher got no money uh, nothing back so that took a lot of time and I told the teachers get the kids onto the plane and I'll be there you know, while I was trying to sort this out. And literally they were calling me to board. It was at that point with United Airlines and I ran. And as I, 2005, so no iPads, no, nothing to entertain you other than one big screen and the uh, cattle class in the middle of the plane. So I thought, well, get a book and read it. So I stopped at this little store and grabbed a book. And the, the book I grabbed was called Inside 9-11. And it was the Spiegel, the German uh, magazine that had investigative reporters literally unpacking every detail of how these guys went about uh, planning 9-11. And I took that book and I'd read some of it and fell asleep, arrived in London on that, uh, uh, that Tuesday and we did our tour and everything. On the Wednesday uh, was the announcement of 2012 London uh, Olympics, who was going to, and it was really between Paris and London. And I'd got the kids out into Trafalgar Square. I had a business lunch with uh, Gulliver's Travel, and it was announced. So everyone was celebrating, and I'm sure you, you remember it. I think, Craig, I can't remember if you were in London at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone was celebrating and loving kind of um, that uh, London had won the Olympic bid for 2012. Uh, remember, this is 2005. And uh, that evening, you and I went out on the Wednesday. And uh, one of the arguments we had was which route to take to get to Liverpool Street. And uh, you'd said to me, take the central line, it's the quickest. Um, but it was not the closest station to Bayswater. Bayswater station was closer than uh, Queensway, which was the central line straight through to Liverpool. And me kind of being the obnoxious person, knowing everything and being your former coach and teacher, I knew better than you. So I took the district line the next morning. Um, but packing the next morning in my rucksack, um, I chose not to take my passport. I took my Walkman and I took my phone and my Nokia and I took um, uh, my uh, the inside 9-11 to read and headed off. And I then chose to take the district line, which was completely ridiculous because um, you know, the district line was a longer way around and I had to cross stations um, at one point to get on to, with the district line to get through to Liverpool Street. And you were right, I should have taken the central line, but uh, I knew better. And taking the district line, took me all the way around and was a lot longer and I got off at about uh, 8.45 my own train uh, sorry not 8.45 about 8.50 and my own train was um, leaving just before I think it was nine o'clock or five to nine and what we established afterwards is that um, whilst I was heading up into the concourse in Liverpool Street and, uh, and I was running because I knew I had to get the overland at 5-2, that first bomb went off as that train had pulled out into Liverpool Station. Um, and um, 
I'd got, uh, went up, exited the, the, the tube, got onto the overland, and as I was kind of settled into my seat, you'd phoned me probably at about quarter past, 20 past nine, and the bomb had gone off at five two. And you'd said, oh, you okay? And I said, yeah, everything's fine. You know, we first thought it was a gas explosion. We didn't know that it was actually a bomb until I'd eventually arrived an hour later at Stansted and for my meeting. Um, and by that time, most of London had started shutting down because the other bombs had gone off as well. And uh, I finished my meeting early, walked back to Stansted, tried to get the train, the stations were closed. So a taxi came up and I got to the taxi driver and said, listen, I'll give you 50 pounds. Can you get me back to London? And he laughed because 50 pounds was not going to get me close to London. So I, I eventually said, oh, well, I've got a hundred pounds cash, which I did. And I gave him a hundred pounds and then he kind of started driving and we were driving through little roads, back roads. It was just felt like we were going forever. And at that point, I think the bus bomb had gone off at uh, Russell Square. Um, and my phone had died. This little Nokia had died long ago. And um, I kept on pushing him. I've got to get into London. I've got to get in. And that, and eventually he stopped um, at, um, at a, in a little town, and um, uh, it was um, Chilton, I think it was. And uh, he said, "Well, wait in the car." And it actually started raining, like just very faint light rain. So I sat in the car and waited, and a couple of minutes passed, and then a bit longer. And he was going to find out about the trains. And next thing there were uh, four police officers, Metro police, surrounded the, um, the, the taxi. And uh, they had started questioning me and asking me why I was wanting to get back into London because the taxi driver had gone and reported this, that this foreign looking guy, and maybe you know, said I looked like an Arab because I had a dark complexion, with a rucksack was trying to get into London. I was like, so I, I tried to explain myself and they wanted my identification, which I never had my passport on me because I'd left it behind. So I said, look, I don't have, and they, they inspected the look at the uh, rucksack and of course what do they pull out the my book inside 9-11 um, and so they start putting two and two together and I'm you know the more you try and act innocent when you actually are innocent yeah. you end up acting guilty so they then were like listen we, we, we're going to detain you in the section 44 of the terrorism act um, so I, I said, look, you can't do that. I'm a school teacher, but you've just told us you went for a meeting with a travel agency. Why are you, if you're a school oh. teacher, why are you going? I was like, phone these guys. Eventually I'd persuaded them and we'd phoned um, the hotel and spoke to the one teacher, Michelle Pretorius there, who concurred with my story. And then they managed to contact the travel agency who concurred with my story as well. And they then, in the meantime, had done a Scotland Yard clearance um, on obviously who I was. I'd given them my ID number and all of that. Anyway, they eventually let me, released me with a note to say that I had been detained under Section 44 of the Terrorism Act. And I then had to um, get back. And of course, all the, um, the entire London had shut down. And I was 20 miles, 36 Ks out of where I needed to go. So with How long did this take before you carry on? How long had you been busy with, you know, these offices? Probably, it wasn't that long, probably about 45 minutes. So it was midday, around about when I kind of started my route march. And, uh, and I walked the 36 Ks into London. And as I got, and I had no, there was no Google Maps, there was nothing. And all, all I kind of did was hope that I'm walking in the right direction and ask people. And the closer I got into London, because I was coming in from the east side and I needed to get to Bayswater. And the closer I was coming into London was like this little salmon swimming upstream because tens of thousands of people were exiting the city and, it, and were walking as well because the whole uh, transport system had shut down. Um, and yeah, so I'd eventually got back to the hotel early evening and um, discovered that uh, of all the kids were back except two little girls were still not back. And the mother had phoned about a thousand times, had sworn at the reception, the teachers, everyone. And then I took the call. And of course, the teachers never knew anything about my day. And I took the call and uh, told the mother where to get off and to calm down. When did she hear about this kid? 
last year from her kid. Her kid had, had emailed her um, or SMSed her around about 2.30 that afternoon. So I said, we're probably in the safest city in the entire world right now. Okay, <laughs> nothing's going to happen. Nothing further is going to happen. So just wait. They're probably shopping. And her daughter had messaged her from Harrods. They were shopping. Harrods was open, believe it or not. And um, about eight o'clock that night, these two little girls came skipping down the road with their shopping parcels. Yeah. And I completely lost it. I mean, I lost it to the extent that all the kids sitting around me just scattered and ran. And uh, I'd, you know, I think I'd used every military voice I could think of. Uh, muster and just literally bellowed at these girls. They were in tears. Eventually they were banned, sent them to their rooms. The rest of the kids were begging to go out because they'd been confined to the hotel for one day, not even, and took them to, uh, took them to uh, Bayswater and sat down with the teachers in a, at a pub and just said, okay, well, let me just tell you about my day because they were complaining that their day was terrible. Was like, let me tell you about my day. <laughs> <laughs> and I was chafed. I had new shoes. I had brand new chinos. I was chafed. I had blisters on my feet. Uh, I don't think I've ever used those shoes ever again. I actually think I threw them away. Yeah. Yes, but what and a crazy those story. Never, those little girls have never been the same since. So they got a no. fright. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And both you of them were Natalie. Natalie. What's that? Both two of them were called Natalie. Yeah, the yes. two Natalies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, man. That's a, it's a mad story. Like, you know, you. I always think with these kind of stories that the truth is stranger than fiction. I imagine, uh, you know, that just imagine what those policemen thought as well. Here's this guy. He's trying to get into the bloody city. He's got this magazine. Like, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous. So. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Sean, one thing that you say, you know, just moving on a little bit from that um, is understand what your purpose is and keep having fun. And the moment you stop having fun, is the, t is the time you need to stop doing what you're doing. Um, and, and so why is this so important in life uh, to you? One, I think the, the, your, your purpose is what motivates you. The moment you don't have a purpose, um, I think that's, yeah, that's really, it, it kind of, for me, it's what drives me. So what is, what is my purpose? And getting to that purpose, the journey needs to be fun. What, whatever you're doing, you need to have fun. Um, and I think that's an element that so often we lose um, and, and, and we forget to have fun. Um, and, and, and maybe it's because I was a teacher, maybe it's because I was a sports coach, maybe it's because whatever I was involved in, I actually was always having fun. Um, so most of my teaching career, I was having fun. When I went into the corporate space, I wasn't having fun anymore. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was a big driver for me of getting out. But you've got to make that decision. I think too often people get into situations where they are too scared. They are too afraid to get out. Um, and for various reasons and very valid reasons as well. Um, so, yeah. I, I, and I think what was so important, because I'd, I'd made that statement probably 100 podcasts ago. Um, and, and in fact, I did. I, mean, I think if I, you go back and look, I've made that comment a hundred podcasts ago. And, and if I hadn't made my decision uh, to kind of exit out of the corporate space, um, I wouldn't be living what's, what I'm preaching. I wouldn't be living, you know, um, wh what I'm saying. So, yeah, I'm actually quite proud of myself for doing that. Yeah, right. it's such a, such a good lesson here. Like, life is short. And we sometimes forget that, you know what I mean? And, and it's such a good reminder that such a big part of life is having fun, is laughing, is just enjoying it. So, so yeah, but I'm glad that you, you're living by that. Um, one of the main themes of your book is uh, overcoming diversity. I just want to confirm is overcoming diversity. Is that what, is that what it is? Mm. Um, cool. Uh, what, what do you, want sort of people to feel like or what sort of message of hope would you like people to take away with them after reading your book? I think it's a, it doesn't matter the situation um, that you find yourself in. Um, I think that uh, you, 
you can overcome obstacles. You can overcome sort of these challenges that are thrown your way. And, and it's how you do it and who you do it with. One of, the, one of the themes that constantly comes through the book, which I never thought of. I mean, that was the other interesting thing, having written the book. There's these, these, comp, these threads that go through the book. And one of the, one of the critical things for me was always surrounding myself with the right people. So I'm not great at many things, but the other people who are way better at things than I am and surrounding yourself with those people in your leadership teams and your sports teams and whatever you're doing, your business, um, th th that contributes to the success. That, that helps you to overcome the challenge of the obstacles that are thrown your way. So I think that, uh, that's definitely something that, uh, that I think people will take away. Uh, is it doesn't matter the obstacle you 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 can overcome it mm, great lessons and, and talking about people around you you know family is is one of those sort of groups that are, or of people are, that are around you that you can go to but you're not a man that's easily intimidated um, but you do say that your dad is is a man who could intimidate you uh, but in a good way so maybe you could just explain to us what do you mean by that exactly yeah, I think one thing that I've always lived by is I've never allowed anyone to intimidate me. Um, it doesn't matter who it is. Sometimes people think they, they can, and there's no reason. There's no reason why anyone should intimidate you, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and that's quite a, it's quite a statement to make, I think. Um, and I don't say it with any bravado or anything, but... The, the one person I think that did intimidate me was my father, but in a positive way, you know, in a way that I always, you know, if my father was upset or angry, I'd shit myself. You know, I shut myself. Like, okay, I'm, I'm worried now. Now I'm worried. Why? Because this massive man, Hulk of a man, is intimidating. You know, so he intimidated me. But I think that taught me that no one else would intimidate me. No one, nothing else could intimidate me. Uh, I think I learned that uh, from uh, being a little kid uh, growing up. So whenever, uh, in any situation, um, uh, I, I'd found myself, I was, I, was never, I was never intimidated by, by anyone. You know, and even you know, more recently in my job, in my more recent career in the corporate space, you know, you've got people there, you've got narcissists who think they are just amazing and that they are so special and that, you know, they, they just have zero EQ um, and uh, that they are intimidating, but they're not intimidating. They're actually quite, it's quite sad. They're actually very sad people. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that was sort of, uh, I think, a very valuable lesson that I'd learned growing up from my dad, which he, he, probably didn't know that he was teaching me. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. So um, I mean, you certainly hold a presence. I can only imagine the sort of presence your dad must have held if he, you know, if he did, did provide that little bit of intimidation for you. Um, so, but, but your book is 15 chapters and we've obviously only touched on, on a few of them. Uh, is there anything else that you would kind of like people to know about your book or that, you know, other stories you'd like to, um, speak about that you think are important uh, that we maybe haven't touched on? You know, there's um, the, 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 the one, the one chapter. Yeah, I think the book is a journey and each chapter is important. Um, and each chapter flows into the next one and tells a story. And I think that's very important. And it, and it, it, tells, it tells a story about, yes, my life, about the people that kind of journeyed with me, decisions I made, what I tried to do, how, how I thought. Um, so I think the, the, for me, the whole book is, is, is important, you know, to, to, to kind of read. One of the, one of the chapters I, 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 Kind of played with in terms of whether I should or shouldn't include it was the second last chapter, which was lights and um, uh, just forgotten the chapter's name now. I think it was chapter fourteen. And um, love and light. And that, 
love and love, love and lighting, love and lighting, lighting, and sorry. and yeah, and and that was about my godson, who uh, a Carl, who uh, was a student of mine, but uh, was a very good friend, very good friend of ours, a son, uh, Joe, and we grew up together. Her and her husband Kurt and uh, Gordon and I were same place in four ways, and um, when Carl was born, we'd just come back from a ski trip, and um, he was born in 1998, so we were there, I was there for his birth, and uh, Joe had always wanted to, um, well, Joe was very proud of telling people that she was in love with me, and I was her first choice, but of course, that was never going to happen, and uh, she called Carl, gave Carl my name for his middle name, Carl Sean, uh, to prayer and uh, he eventually came to my school when I was headmaster and um, when he was eventually in grade in 2014 in grade 10 uh, we he'd been begging I, 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 he'd been going to gym so I went to gym with him you know the experience Gareth take you to gym train you what you do how you press the weights how you hold the bar breathing all that stuff and he was really getting into his gym so it was great we, I was his godfather and we spent uh, some uh, some good times training together at gym and going out. We were always there for dinners and we'd been on ski trips away, uh, you know, through the years. And he had been hankering now because he was turning 16. He wanted a uh, bike. So I gave him my, um, I got him to buy uh, my scooter because I wasn't using it anymore. And he then sprayed it black and put on stickers and made it all funky. And that was in July of 2014. And um in October of uh, that year, we broke up for school uh, end of term three, and I'd, got, I'd signed his report because I was the headmaster, and I saw, and he hadn't done well, and he hadn't applied himself, which is typical. Um, but I was the headmaster, so I sent him a WhatsApp, and I said, listen, you need to come and see me. So he said, am I in trouble? And I said, just come and see me. So he walked into the office, sat down, and said, okay, listen, you haven't delivered the results. You're not working. He wants to be a DJ. Um, and um, we had a massive argument where he told me to get out of his life and uh, to, um, you know, just stop meddling in his life. So I said, okay, well, am I getting out of your life as the headmaster, as your uncle, or as your godfather, what? And he said, no, 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 not as um, my godfather, but as the headmaster, you need to, you can't be involved in my life like that. I said, well, you don't have a choice, you know, because I am going to, and I'm the adult, yeah, and I'm telling you now, you're not applying yourself. So we had an argument and anyway, he left and, uh, and uh, walked out of uh, my office. And I remember Joe saying to me a couple of days later that uh, the next day he had gone home and told him he wants to go to Kez. He's, I had enough of being in the same school as his godfather and he wants to leave and go to Kez. And um, that was that evening and the coming weekend, he was better and was fine. Okay, he's not as murring with me as he wanted to. And we, Gordon and I had gone down to a house in Pringle Bay and um, he um, had uh, taken the bike. One of the agreements on the bike was only to be used to go to school and back and he wasn't allowed to drive in the evening with it. And it was a, a Wednesday morning and we, uh, we got a call. Uh, I, I was about to go to gym there in Somerset West and uh, got a call and it was a tow truck driver and Carl had T-boned a BMW and uh, he was in a really bad state. And um, uh, so I'd managed to get hold of Joe, who was having her hair done. And she then uh, shot across to Flora Clinic where they took him. And uh, sadly, he died uh, in uh, probably about two or three hours after the accident. And I was stuck in Pringle Bay. And of course, this was um, just, I mean, it was so traumatic. And uh, anyway, I managed to get a flight flu that evening. And um, the next morning, got, the, got that Wednesday evening late, Thursday morning, got to Joe, and uh, she was in a complete state. And um, he, Carl's dad, he had been visiting his dad and was driving back to go home to his mom on that Wednesday morning. And as he was coming down uh, the road, a BMW driver uh, turned and Carl obviously hit the car full impact and the injuries were just too, too, too traumatic for him to, to recover. And, and then I went into fix it mode and had to 
do everything. So then had to go and identify the body at the morgue, uh, which in itself was just unbelievably tragic. Um, then kind of deal with all the things in terms of, um, because Joe wasn't in a state and uh, his dad, they divorced already. So that was not going to work. And so I'd put everything together and did everything. And the, the, then um, the school started the following week and I had to go back to school and address the students as the headmaster, but also as Carl's godfather. And a teacher had died the day before of an illness, a teacher that was with us that had left a few months previously. So I had to announce this. I had to make sure I, I gave this teacher kind of the respect that he needed because he had passed away and then had to then talk about Carl passing away in his audience of 800 people. And it was an incredibly emotional and traumatic time for me because I still had to keep it together because you're the headmaster of the school. Your godson's died on a scooter that you gave him. The reason tells you, listen, you didn't do this. It's not your fault, but that's not how it works. You know, you're, you don't, your mind doesn't allow you to think that. Um, and, um, and then we had the memorial service and I addressed, I spoke as his godfather and then had the funeral, uh, as a private kind of funeral at uh, this Four Ways Memorial Park. And, um, and then, and then I, Gordon and I followed the hearse and took the, you know, went all the way to the, cemetery, the crematorium in uh, Krugersdorp and sat and waited with obviously the Carl and uh, the coffin and uh, we sat and waited until it was ready and kind of put the coffin on the rollers and and that was it you know um, and and I debated whether or not I would write about it and I thought it was so important for me because there are teachers that will read it there are students there are families there are parents moms dads godfathers doesn't matter who who might go through a similar experience um, and I think all have gone through it, a similar experience. And I think for them to be able to read it um, and actually kind of get an understanding that even after all of that, life still goes on. You know, life still goes on. And when you're living through that, you don't believe that life will go on, but actually it does. And that was for me such a powerful message. And, and I wanted to leave that right to the end. Uh, one chronologically, but two kind of uh, it's 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 a tough chapter. And I remember the the editors um, kind of who'd worked on the book with me when they read it for the first time, they were absolutely you know in tears. And there are two chapters that uh, that when I read the book uh, that I always get emotional in. And one's chapter fourteen, and the other one's chapter fifteen, with literally the last paragraph of chapter fifteen, which was my final assembly. And, and kind of my closing, my chapter of being physically a headmaster at a school and my teaching career, literally. Um, and the, the, the last uh, sort of uh, paragraph is probably the most powerful um, paragraph that, uh, that in, the, in the whole book for me. So, and then I get to the end of those chapters and I'm bawling my eyes out and I'm yes. so emotional. I'm like, Why have I put this in? What is happening? I can't do this. I'm crying. Uh, and, uh, and then I phone the, my publisher, Tim, and I go, I've read these chapters again. I've just got emotional. I'm mean, crying again. Why do I put this in? And he's like, you need to listen to me. Put them in. This is very important, you know? So, yeah. So, so I think, as much as the book is positive there's there's also there's also a positive message out of a tragedy as well you know there's a positive message out of the homophobia out of uh, the, the london bombings out of you know out of the carl's accident and losing his life and me leaving the school i think that was uh, that, that, that's what that's what i've loved about writing the book hmm. sure bud that was thanks for sharing that man that gave me a had a lump in my throat just listening to that because I, I I even I even recall it's like you know and just thinking at the time oh, this, how tragic it was so thanks for thanks for sharing the story yeah I, I mean and also just thanks for representing so much truth and so much uh, just bearing all of that and that vulnerability uh, that you've shown through through your book and through your story and sharing it with us here today. It's just been, uh, it's very uh, helpful and meaningful to others. Like you say, 
hearing it and listen and reading your well when they read your book it's uh it is super meaningful so through those tragedies you know some some good comes from it you know so thanks for that but maybe just to bring this home uh sean what are what are are two great bits of advice that that you could give people listening to us that have really helped you in your life i'm not always sure that i'm qualified to give advice to people uh other than you know um other than kind of giving examples and and uh, of of my own experiences and then kind of then and people then making their own decisions um uh, around those experiences you know um i i think what's worked for me might not work for other people what what's uh, you know um i think what's important is you, you and what has always worked for me is I have an incredible um, network of friends uh, and people, uh, a really, really strong network. Um, and interestingly, most of them are past students uh, who are now scattered around the world. Um, and that has been that has been very special, and that has been very powerful for me. So. Um, because I, I, I feed off that energy of their success, of what they're doing, of them having been inspired by me or me actually, what they, what they forget is that they actually have inspired me in, in many things. So even the person on my top left of my screen over there sitting with his uh, little beard um, and uh, it, it has been incredibly inspiring. And for me, uh, I've, I've been incredibly proud of what uh, he's done and what he's achieved and the same with other students. So, so it's, the advice is, is it's, it's, it's kind of the people you associate with, the people you are friends with, the people, what you take out of that friendship, what you give to those relationships. I think that's incredibly important. So it's not really advice. It's just, it's the experience. It's, it's what's worked for me. Um, if that makes any sense. Mm. Totally. The people around you there, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. That's, I think, um, really, really powerful to, to realize that it, it can be as simple as that, you know, just have good people around you and, and nurture those bonds. So you've, you've certainly done that. Mm. And I've seen that through Gareth and, and, and others, you know, so that's, it really comes through, so that's awesome. So, so what are you what are you excited about moving forward, uh, Sean? And and what do you have coming up? Otherwise, you know, obviously the book launch is it's the face of it has changed, but I, I'm assuming you're going to be doing stuff there. And and also then, if you can just explain or tell people how they can get in touch with you and the book. So obviously. yeah, so the, the book kind of ends off with saying, "Watch the space," you know, and. And I'm now watching the space and nothing's bloody well happening. So, <laughs> so I'm like, what is supposed to happen now? And, uh, but the book is obviously a very sh a short term, couple of months at the most, I probably got, gets uh, six to eight months out of the book. But the book's really been a, a calling card for kind of, you know, uh, moving on. It, it establishes your legacy as a person. You, you leave a permanent contribution that people always be able to read and refer back to or whatever the story is. But it, it was, the, what was so important for me about the book, the plan was to take the book into schools, into organizations and tell the good stories and, um, and kind of be a positive message. I think uh, I had a very brief interview on one of the radio stations yesterday uh, about the book um, and um, I'd say to them, I said, listen, please forgive the generalization with the media, but the media love to tell the tragedy of the Parktown boys story where the water polo coach is arrested for molesting the players and they will milk that to death or the kid that was tragically killed, uh, drowned in the beginning of the year on an on a orientation camp, but they don't tell the positive stories and for me that's what the book was about about telling the positive stories and telling good stories and 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 kind of just that human face very much what you guys do with your podcast you want to tell you know those wonderful human stories um so 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 that's kind of 
was the short-term thing to get into schools, get into organizations, speak to people, share those positive stories. The other part is uh, I'm, I'm trying to buy a school. Uh, I've got some really great partners and we're looking at uh, a school and um, we've put in a bid for one school and the exciting part is I'm up against my previous employers. So that's, that's great. And, 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 and I'm excited about that because it's a beautiful, magnificent school. And, um, and uh, I'll hear in the next couple of days whether my bid is successful. Uh, Gareth doesn't know anything about this yet, but uh, yeah, so that's massive. And, and it took me a week to, to put the whole thing together. Um, and I think it's fantastic that I'm up against both my previous employers, uh, big corporate organizations. Um, and if it doesn't materialize, that's fine. The experience was amazing. And, and, and just getting to the part where the board of the school that are looking to sell just have taken you seriously enough uh, to actually consider your bid and to take your bid through. So, so that's an exciting part. And, and of course, I would love my own school because... Um, at, when I say my own school, it's never your school. It's actually not your school at all. The school belongs to the students, belongs to the parents, belongs to the teachers, belong. It's, it's a legacy, the, the, the school. Uh, but to be able to drive a school that the buck will stop with me, that responsibility. So to be able to set the, the, you know, to the values of, of what happens in that. So that would be, that really is my ultimate goal is, is, is to have my own school and grow my own school network. Mm -hmm. Super exciting. So exciting, but and um, obviously we put in all the social media links and stuff. But where, where is best for people to get hold of you and like to find out about the book um, yeah. if they want to get their hands so, on? So, so the so the best way is to just go to my website, which is uh, seanfox.co.za, and then just click on the link. It's uh, it's it says buy the book. So it's just, <laughs> Click on that and you buy the book and you just add it to the cart and that there, there is international shipping. So a lot of, a, a, a lot of my students from, I mean, the books heading to uh, uh, West coast of America, Canada, New Zealand, uh, Australia, uh, Japan. Um, so students of mine all over the world have already bought the book uh, pre-ordered and uh, so it's heading there but obviously locally it's 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 easy so it'll be delivered locally it can be delivered now during lockdown so that's not a problem so seanfox.co.za it'll be on the shelves at exclusive books round about mid-june so they could buy it there as well um, and uh, yeah those are the two easiest places to get it awesome stuff man Thanks a lot, bud, for sharing that. And just our last question, um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Mm, it's such a lovely name for the podcast, uh, Ridiculously Human, because, um, and, and I, think the, I think the word ridiculous is, for me, is a positive, it's such a positive kind of, um, uh, it just leaves such positive thoughts, ridiculously human. Um, and and, and, and I, it probably speaks to the fact that how, how unique we are. I mean, just uh, how unique we are, how special we are as human beings, how absolutely pathetic we are, how amazing we are. Um, and you can kind of take all those words and put them together. Um, and, uh, but I think the, 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 the real message out of ridiculously human is that as human beings, we, we, we're actually okay. We're actually nice people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Can true. But the majority deep. of us. Yeah. Yeah. I like think the best for each other at the end of the day, deep down. Hey, mm. yeah, yeah, totally. Absolutely. Deep. Yeah. Deep down. I think we're all, well, you know, for the large majority is we just wired as good people and we want cool things yeah. and we generally want the same things and we must remember that. Um, but Pat, I just wanted to say uh, thanks massively for for coming on the podcast um, and you know sharing more about the book. I, I swear, like I feel like it's just this little taste there now, and and I literally cannot wait to read all these chapters because there sounds like there's so many cool stories in there, and I, and I love what you say, uh, whereby you know there, there's so many tragedies in life, but you know life does carry on. And 
there are positives that that you know come off the back of of negative things and i think we just need to kind of remember that that this is the cycle of life and it sounds like your book is a you know real good example of that um and just two things like that that really sort of have stood out for me and do stand out for me just about you know you as a person um one thing that you said now um about advice you said you don't know if you are qualified to give advice and i mean obviously you are qualified to give advice but i just love that thought process whereby you're like hang on you know people kind of in a way need to learn for themselves um but off the back of that as well you lead through action do you know what i mean and if people want to do the same then they can do the same and that's that's how you've kind of always done things you know so like look what i do and follow me if you want to and and i think that's been a huge thing for me you know in my life like you know having someone like you to look up to and sort of follow your guidance just through your actions so so thanks so much for that and the other one which which I, I literally think about in, in almost every situation that I'm in that might get heated or I might disagree with or what, you know, where you can see there's like some sort of arguments or whatever that might pop up is just be calm. Be calm in how you deal with things. Be calm in how you react. And just sort of drop the, I don't know, dro drop the intensity of, of, of your reaction. And that just really smooths things out nicely and um, takes control of kind of situations is just by being calm. And you would think like, it would, you know, that that's not powerful, but that is powerful. Um, so th that's, that's just such an amazing lesson that I, that I, I, I even remember the time that I, that it clicked for me. It was on like one of the, the trips that you were on overseas and there was, you know, some kid that did something really wrong and you just went, Hey, just come here. And you just spoke to them calmly and nicely. And I looked at you and I was like, wow, that's how you diffuse situations and you manage things. So, you know, just thanks for everything in my life, but I can't wait to read the book. Thanks for sharing more detail with it. And um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Cool. Great. Thank you. Pleasure. Just managed, and shortly, just short from my side. Yes. I'm really excited to read the book as well. As someone that, you know, regrettably wasn't uh, at school with you just by all accounts just a wonderful human being but the, the book offers so much of just life you know and and I think that's why I'm really excited to read it and obviously as a South African there's going to be anecdotes there that are, are also going to just creep in and, and just make me laugh and I could just tell already but you know just as Gareth said you're just one of the most genuine people that I've met and and interacted with a certain assertiveness and calmness uh, is such a powerful, you hold a lot of power in with, within that calmness as Gareth said and well, but you, you're not intimidating. You, you know, you were speaking about intimidating, but you're very confident and you've somehow passed the, the two apart and, and kept the confidence, but without making someone feel um, intimidated. So I don't know, not, not many people pull that off well, so keep it up. And then just thanks for sharing your story and, we can't wait to see where, where this all goes and, you know, watch awesome. the future, as you said. So keep it up and uh, thanks again for today. It's a pleasure. And uh, thank you for, I'm delighted to have my second podcast with you guys. And I think maybe in closing the, uh, the uh, I've had to sign movie rights and all sorts of things. And, and I think George Clooney will probably be good at playing me. I've got to yeah. just spend some time working with him on the calmness and the assertiveness. But <laughs> it's, yeah, probably George Clooney, I think. What do you think, Tana? Movie <laughs> deals in the cards? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, classic, George right. Clooney. <laughs> George. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, 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 get, we'll get Matt Damon to play you in the London in the 7-7. Seven, seven. Uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and you've always said to dream big, so I stop now, hey? Seriously. <laughs> Uh, yeah, classic. classic cool, All man. Right. All right, Thanks, bud. Thanks, man. Thank cool, you. Bud. Bye. Cool, bud, bud. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging.